Well, you'd think the election was this fall and not next fall for all the positioning that's going on in Ottawa. Like, did you say flip-flop? Stay tuned. Andrew, Althea and Jennifer, all at the table tonight. Example number one, uh, Tom Mulcair. First clip is from the night he won uh, the leadership convention. Second clip is this week. Watch this. What about the Liberals? What about if they want to talk? No, and, and there's a reason. Is that a, like a firm rejection? I'll tell you why I asked. It's I categorical. It. We've always said that we were willing to work with other parties. We're a progressive party. We want to get results. I'll let other uh, parties explain to you why they don't think that that's a good idea. All right. Seems like a bit of a change. I'll tell you, you were in that scrum. <laughs> Are we looking at a change here? Absolutely. Um, I has sat down with Tom Mulcair in uh, 2012 when he was running for leadership, and he looked me straight in the eye and he said, in many different ways, absolutely no, this is never going to happen. Did you get that? I asked him like three different ways. No, no, it's no, it's no, it's no. And now it's, well, no, we've always been willing to work with other parties. That's what Jack Layton was all about. People want us to work together. Um, it's an absolute flip-flop. Complete change of heart, very different strategy. They are bleeding votes to the Liberals. Their supporters want them to get rid of Stephen Harper. And if the ballot question is, who has the best chance of getting rid of Stephen Harper, Tom Mulcair or Justin Trudeau, and it looks like the polls suggest it's Justin Trudeau, well, the NDP isn't going to be sitting in the Commons with 103 seats. So um, I think that's what all this is about. Jennifer, mm. you see that one? Well, it's like if you said, uh, I wouldn't listen to country music if my life depended on it. And then you realize, hmm, lots of people like country music. <laughs> Maybe if it was on the radio, I'd listen to it. It was <laughs> Brooks and Dunn or something like that. I think that's where things are at. You want to sort of seem magnanimous as possible because you don't want, know what might happen after the next election. And incidentally, Michael Ignatieff equivocated in exactly the same way. He did an interview with my colleague Joan Bryden and said sort of the same thing that Mulcair was saying now. You know, well, we'll see what happens after the election. You know, uh, there's nothing wrong with a coalition. It's, it's a legitimate body. But you'll remember what Ignatiev said once the election was called. Did he ever use the C word yesterday, coalition? Did he ever use that? No, he um, phrased it as being, well, we're not going to run 338 candidates together. We're going to run our own slate of candidates. And we asked him, this is like a barrage of reporters, we all ganged up on him, and said, that's not what we're asking you. We're asking you about a formal coalition after the election. And he did not repeat the word, and he refused to actually answer the question. What do you make of all this? Uh, two years ago, when he gave that interview, the NDP were 15 points ahead of the Liberals. Uh, today, they're 12 points behind them. I think that explains a great deal. When you're uh, ahead, when you're the prohibitive favorite to be the the alternative to the to the to the conservatives, why would you want to you know share that vote? You're going to try and get everybody under your tent. Now, I think there's some strategic reason why he would flip on this. One is the liberals are trying to sort of effortlessly straddle the center in that classic liberal way, and by attaching himself to the liberals, he can kind of scare off some of that right of center vote and force the liberals to actually have to work for that vote rather than just scoop it in. And the other thing is the classic liberal play always when, when it comes down to these elections and say, you have to vote for us to keep the Tories out. If, you can, if the Tories can win the election, i.e. Have a, have a minority and still not form a government, that allows New Democrat voters to stay with the NDP. So talking up a coalition at this point is advantageous for the NDP, not so much for the liberals. Mm -hmm. But I just thought that talking up a coalition for anybody was suicide. Was suicide. <laughs> I, I would have thought that too. <laughs> and it actually came up today in the House in the statements before question period. Mm -hmm. um, one of the Conservative MPs y used that, talked about, hey, well, coalition, unholy coalition. So um, it's, no, it's interesting that they're taking that risk. There's no particular reason why it's suicidal. There's nothing wrong with it, first of all. Uh, Harper and the Conservatives are perfectly entitled to point out that this may well be the likely uh, result and for some voters that will be scary because they don't want to have that. But lots of other voters are going to be perfectly fine. And there's with no it. block threat. That's right. Yeah, I, yeah, I think right. the, I think the block is the, managed is the... to spin that last election onto the coalition issue. Because particularly for the Liberals at that time, it was not in their interest for the reasons I've been saying mm. to, to allow that coalition thing to come on. I think the Liberals had to try and, and keep that off the table. And quite rightly, the Conservatives were perfectly entitled, as I say, to put that out there as a possibility. What they were wrong and should not be allowed to get away with is saying that this is somehow unconstitutional or a dirty pool. It's perfectly valid within our system. But, you know, if you're going after center-right voters, you're going to pay a price if you're forming a coalition of the left. Those voters are going to say, well, that's not for me. Well, that's what 
um, Stephen Harper and the Conservatives argued in 2008 that it wasn't legitimate, that it was in, unconstitutional yeah, to actually and have that was and and that should was, never. But the other thing that was really interesting this week is that the, one of the lightning bolts, I think, about the coalition was the participation of the bloc. And it's emerged that it was Thomas Mulcair who was responsible for bringing the bloc on side to that coalition. Emerged by whom? Well, um, Anne McGrath, who is now his advisor and was okay. former chief of staff to Jack Layton, told me that this week. And it was news to me. And I think it will be news to a lot of Canadians. And I'm not sure that that's actually a great thing, especially out west, to have Thomas Mulcair, the guy who brought in the bloc to the coalition. What is Justin Trudeau saying about all this? Is he saying anything? He's yeah, just my, sitting there with a smile on his, his face? Or what? No, he yeah. hasn't. He does not want to work in a coalition. He said that was his message during the leadership race, and that is still his message now. He says there are big cleavages between the NDP and the Liberals on issues like uh, the Clarity Act and national unity, and he doesn't want to be a partner with the NDP. And again, don't when you're 12 points ahead, mm -hmm. you want to make the case that you're the party that mm -hmm. can beat the Conservatives. You don't want to share that vote. Mm -hmm. All right. The second example of uh, a possible flip-flop this week uh, is from the Prime Minister. It's on the issue of income splitting. You remember a couple of weeks ago at the budget, the finance minister backed away from that uh, conservative promise, at least said he didn't think it was a good idea at this time. Uh, but, and the prime minister seemed to side with his finance minister, but he's not talking that way this week. Watch this. As I said in uh, Stouffville a couple of weeks ago and said during the election campaign, we think uh, income splitting would be an excellent policy for Canadian families, just as it has been an excellent policy for Canadian seniors. So what do we make of that, Jennifer? I'm, what I make of that is the Conservative caucus has spoken, <laughs> and last week was a break week. Conservative MPs heard from their constituents. They especially heard from party activists who said, wait a second, you told us that you were going to do income splitting. I, this isn't a flip-flop. This is like a boomerang, right? You know, like, we're doing it. We're not doing it. We're doing it. And uh, Harper said, I said two weeks ago that income splitting is good for family. He didn't say that. He was at, asked point blank by both reporters and in the House, what about income splitting? And he, if you remember, he mm -hmm. wouldn't use the words. He said, we're for tax relief for Canadian families. That's right. So something's happened uh, in, the, in the interim. And what's happened is the caucus said, this is important to us and you, you must do this. Now, whether um, it will exist in the form that it was promised in the last election, that's up for debate. I think it's going to be tweaked. What does this do to the finance minister? What does he say now? Well, it's interesting. I mean, first of all, this looks like a flip, flop, flip I think we have to invent a new <laughs> term for it. I think there's, it's, you said the caucus, I think also some pretty important members of cabinet uh, must have also weighed in pretty heavily on this. And when you look at this, the, the concatenation of events of uh, uh, Jim Flaherty uh, musing aloud now that maybe he's not going to run the next election, mm -hmm. which I think means he's not running in the next election, the Harper flip-flop flip, and Jason Kenney having a particularly strong week, it looks like he's going to be able to, looks like, pull in a, a deal with the provinces on the, on the Canada job grant. Uh, if it's a, a, a power struggle between Jason Kenney and Jim Flaherty on this, um, I think that looked like like Kenney won this one. Mm. We're, it's game on, right, Althea? I mean, we're, we're into the election campaign now. This is turning into American politics, right? We're into a year and a half or longer of well, uh, an campaign election campaign. the campaign ads aren't on the airwaves just yet. <laughs> no. Well, um, yeah, they're on the sort of airwaves of, uh, of the Internet, though. Yeah, um, I think Jen's entirely right about the income splitting. I've been told there were about 30 people who took to the mic on Wednesday to complain about, you, you must keep this promise. We knocked on doors, you have to keep your word. Um, but it, I, I feel like they're at a tight spot, and they've already said, or, or looked at the numbers and thought, well, you know, this isn't actually a big vote-getter. These people that are supportive of this will vote for us anyways. So what can we offer to get more people to vote for us next time? Um, expand that tent or perhaps just trying to cling to a minority. And uh, income splitting wasn't it. So I'm not sure that it's still there, or maybe it's we're going to do income splitting and, and something, something else. else. I yeah. think people yeah. underestimate, though, the appeal even outside the target group. And that is, this is an unusual thing, to lay out an election promise four years ahead of time and to say, when we balance a budget, we will do X. For the party to be able to keep their word on that uh, and, on such a long time frame I think would be quite impressive to a lot of voters who didn't, weren't necessarily going to benefit from the, uh, from the program itself, but just, a, oh my goodness, they actually kept their word and, on this. But people forget there were three or four other things they promised to do once the budget yeah. was balanced. Mm -hmm. And we haven't heard about those. For instance, an adult fitness tax credit seems to have sort of floated away. I mean, if you Absolutely ask wouldn't. about it, you don't get an answer. <laughs> Is so, that right? yeah. Or doubling the tax-free savings account limit. We, we don't know. They haven't really talked about whether that's going to happen. So.
Fair Elections Act. Uh, this has been uh, on the table now for the last couple of weeks, and it's into what? It's into committee, committee and, then, and they're going to travel across the country to talk about They're not going to travel across the country. That was one of the arguments about what happened. Um, we haven't really discussed it around this table. It's been very contentious in Ottawa, uh, and it's been a subject of debate through question period quite, a, quite often. Um, is the Fair Elections Act fair? Uh, I think you get a lot of people, and I would be one of them, that say it's got some real problems. It, 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 the, 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 the call going into this was we had a lot of irregularities in the last election. Uh, and without sort of placing any blame, there's a clear interest for all of us in having a strong investigator to be able to, to look into that. Uh, well, instead, they seem to have hemmed in the, the uh, Elections Canada people more than they were previously hemmed in. They're, they've reduced their powers including moving the whole investigative thing out of Elections Canada into the Director of Public Prosecution's office. They're preventing Elections Canada from encouraging people to vote. They are, uh, you know, making... A, a, no, I'm, I'm blanking the other changes, but they are... Uh, what, what, what you find when you go down the list of them are, some of them are good, some of them are bad, but they all are in the interest of the Conservative Party. Now, I think that on top of that, the issue is, uh, whatever you're doing, changing, making changes to the Elections Act, the tradition surely is that you get all party buy-in on it. That this, yeah. this, above all things, you have to get a sense that nobody's trying to tilt the balance in their favor. And what they've done is limited debate, limited the committee hearings, just ramming it through, and that's got to mm -hmm. make everybody alarmed. Don't worry about blanking. <laughs> <laughs> it happens you, you can run for the governor of Texas. You know, it's not a problem. Right. But a Andrew's right. It's one of those central statutes, central pieces of legislation in our system. That and the electoral boundaries. Act. You just don't mess with that because that, that's what keeps the, the playing field level between the parties. It's sort, of, it's sort of one of those sacred pieces of legislation. So you can see why the opposition is looking. They look when they do the electoral boundaries, for example, everyone looks with the microscope who's going to benefit from this. And it's the same with the Elections Act. So um, the, the, I think that what's problematic here, there are some good things in, in the legislation. For example, they're, they're um, increasing penalties. Um, they're introducing new regulations on people who make robocalls. There's all kinds of stuff. But they open themselves up to criticism by uh, putting restrictions on what the chief electoral office, officer can say, by getting rid of voting, voter identification cards that might hurt um, Aboriginals, uh, uh, the, um, youth, and people who are in low-income brackets. Um, and the whole way they pushed it through. Right. So, uh, and, and the speed at which, which they're pushing it through. So, you know, Andrew's completely right. To get that sort of multi-party buy-in, you don't do that by doing it at warp speed. Let's see what happens at committee, whether they're going to have full range of, of witnesses come and whether they're going to take in all the recommendations. I'll see. I'm going to go further. I think this bill is actually about voter suppression. I think that it stacks the decks in the Conservatives' favour. And sometimes you do make changes, like the Liberal government under Jean Chrétien made massive changes to the way um, uh, political parties are funded. And his party took a big hit. It really helped the Conservatives at the time. The changes that the Conservatives are bringing at the moment um, in some cases, they will help the Conservatives a lot now. Perhaps they will benefit the Liberals. But in most cases, it prevents people who traditionally don't vote for the Conservatives from voting. It uh, adds a degree of political interference in the way that Elections Canada investigates and is run. Real concerns that the uh, Chief Electoral Officer identified during the robocall investigation. I'm having trouble doing this investigation because political staffers are not being uh, are forthcoming with information. I need these changes to allow this to allow other investigations to uh, continue more completely. We're not and we're not acted upon at all. Um, there are a lot of problems with this bill, and the reason the Conservative government is rushing it through and does not want to have hearings anywhere is because they don't want anyone to talk about it. No, thirty seconds left. You go that far? <laughs> well, it wouldn't go quite that far. There are there are measures in the bill that are supportable that may even benefit the Conservative Party, but, but just because they benefit them aren't necessarily means that they're bad policy. I would defend, for example, not allowing vouching. I think it's a good idea that you, sh you should have actually have ID when you vote. It's a, that's something that can be debated back and forth, but it's not just self-evidently, in my view, just a voter suppression thing. But they haven't provided any information to support their claims that there is a problem. Absolutely. So, so all the more reason to open it out to proper discussion and proper debate and proper hearings and, and, and not this attempt to kind of one-sidedly smuggle it through. But I don't think it's, it, you know... We should say the former uh, chief elections officer gave it an A, I think it was an A minus. Yeah, so, I don't think you read it. <laughs> well, I'm going to say that. I don't think you read it. <laughs> Boy, you're really on to this one. <laughs> I, I think it's a really serious bill, and I hope that people wake up and see what's in it, because I don't think it's fair. The opposition party is actually right to call the unfair elections act. All right. Well, we certainly know where you stand. <laughs>
Althea, Jennifer, thanks both for being here. Andrew.